All right, time to start on kinematics. Today we're going to talk about motion of a body. <coughs> um, so a body being a continuum body. A continuum body, um, which we'll denote with generally like a letter B, is a set of you know material points that occupies and completely fills a closed region in Euclidean space. So in other words, if the body has voids in it, um, we're going to say that those voids are not part of the body. And so the body can deform and smush and squish and everything, but its topology is going to remain the same. And um, in particular, you know, it, a point in space either has or does not have that body in it. So it's not like a, uh, it's not half filled with that body or something like that. We'll talk about configurations of the body, which is basically any way that its material could be smushed and moved around into filling space in Euclidean space um, without violating some rules like it can't penetrate itself, you can't collapse regions to zero volume, things like that. So basically anything into which it could potentially be deformed. So the admissible configuration is a region in Euclidean space. So we're identifying the configuration of the body with the region of space that it occupies, and we'll identify the points of the material with the points in space that they occupy. So B is a subset of Euclidean space with which The material points can be made to coincide through a smooth deformation. So the motion of a body defines a diffeomorphism between the co configurations that the material body occupies as it evolves through time.
So diffeomorphism is a fancy <clears throat> gradual level math word, but basically what it means is that the body can get smushed and turned around and everything, but its topology doesn't change. So if a set is open, meaning say it has volume, but it doesn't include its boundary, just like the open interval in you know 1D, like your open parentheses one that doesn't include its endpoints, um, then it remains open and you know sets that are contained within sets. So like say we have a body B at a, and it goes to B say at T1. Um, if we have some set of points in the body here, call it P1, it remains in the body. And if we have another one, P2, that's contained entirely in there, it's going to remain entirely inside P1, that sort of thing. And points that are on the boundary are going to remain on the boundary. That's what it means to not alter the topology. Mathematically, we're going to describe the motion of the body in terms of displacements relative to a fixed reference configuration. So everything, you pick one configuration and call it the reference configuration. And then everything else is described in terms of a deformation from that. Put that on the next page here. <clears throat> The choice of reference configuration is arbitrary. Um, it doesn't even have to be a configuration that the body occupies at any time. It just has to be one that it could be, you know, smushed and moved into occupying without violating geometry, you know, so it couldn't uh, self-penetrate or collapse to zero volume or anything in between. But there are some common choices of reference configuration, and the most common choices are either the initial configuration, so how things are laying in space at the start of the problem, or what's called the natural reference configuration, which is the stress-free reference configuration. So the initial configuration is usually chosen for fluid mechanics. And also for linear elasticity, if you're talking about small perturbations from 
the start. And two, the natural. And this is almost always the choice. How did, what? I don't even know what that is. That was a nice circle, better than I could draw. Uh, this is almost always used in solid mechanics. Or nonlinear elasticity, anything like that. Um, because that's where it makes the most sense to make your constitutive laws, you want to talk about strain relative to the configuration in which there is no stress and then, you know, kind of build your stress in terms of strain relative to where you wouldn't have any stress. <clears throat> All right. So to describe the motion of a body, will define its configuration at any time t in terms of a deformation of the reference configuration. I'll write that out. So we'll define the deformation chi of x and t, which gives returns the point occupied. by the point, by the material at point x in the reference configuration body. at time t in the deformed or spatial configuration. So deformed, current, and spatial configuration are all synonyms. And we'll denote the spatial body as kind of a script B sub T. So that's the configuration at time T. <coughs> so in other words, the points occupied by the body in the current configuration or spatial are equal to the image actually let's uh, do it this way first the image of the reference body under this uh, deformation map 
chi. Um, and we'll introduce the notation chi t of x um, for notational convenience. Central to the being able to do anything with all of this mathematically is the notion that all of the admissible configurations live in the same background Euclidean point space. So that way we could pick some fixed orthonormal basis and describe both the reference configuration and the spatial configuration in terms of that fixed basis and coordinate system. Points and vectors associated with the reference configuration are called material points and vectors. And we'll denote them as bold uppercase letters when we're doing it in the tech, you know, when typesetting. So that would be just like in the textbook. And um, I'll use fancy non italicized uppercase with bars over them when writing by hand. So the reference configuration is going to get a uh, non-italicized uppercase letter, just like in the textbook. And these are called material points and vectors. this when handwriting <clears throat> All right, points and vectors associated with the current or spatial configuration are called spatial points or vectors, and we'll denote them the normal way with lowercase letters. So bold, lowercase when typesetting. Lowercase single underlined when writing. <clears throat> All 
All right, I'll kind of give you a little pictorial example of what I'm talking about here in regard to there being a background Euclidean space that all of our configurations live in. Uh, so let's draw our background Euclidean space. All right, so here's a little window into Euclidean space. It, of course, stretches infinitely in all the other directions. And somewhere over here, maybe we have, make it a, uh, Green's probably good for the reference configuration. Why not? So we have some reference configuration. Good continuum mechanics, potato. Actually, that's not a very good one because it's got a kink in it, and we're not looking at ones that have kinks in them. That's going to be good enough. <laughs> so here's our reference body, B, and here's a point in it. All right, we'll draw a little around it. All right, so maybe at some time T naught, we have B looking like this. And maybe X goes to, let's do this, move this over a little. So this here is the spatial configuration at time t naught. And maybe down over here, <coughs> we have the spatial configuration at time t1. X is equal to chi of reference point X and T1. And here is B, T1. All right, well. The map from here to here is chi of B T naught. And the map from here to here is chi B T one. <clears throat> so the body actually occupies this configuration at time t naught, and can we zoom back out? Yeah, and this configuration at time t one. Um, the actual path that it takes might, you know, might do something like that, um, and it's moving and squishing, but it never actually has to occupy the reference configuration. The reference configuration 
is just a mathematical tool that gives us something to map back to so that we can define this chi function, which is what's going to allow us to describe things mathematically. Careful to grab the stylus and not the pencil. That'll do some damage. All right, see if we can. Good, I think. Yeah. All right, so. <clears throat> chi, the deformation, maps material points in the reference configuration to the points they occupy at time t in the spatial configuration. And like I said before, chi is called the deformation. <clears throat> the gradient of the deformation. So the deformation maps points to points. So its gradient is going to map tangent vectors in the material configuration, the reference configuration, to tangent vectors in the spatial configuration. And it's a tensor. And it's called the deformation gradient most often. And we use it pretty often in the context of continuum mechanics. So we give it its own designation. This is the tensor F, which is defined as the gradient of chi x in the reference configuration at time t. Like I said, it maps tangent vectors. So think infinitesimal displacements. So in other words, if we have the reference body over here, 
and we have three points in there. Uh, we'll call it x1, x2, x3. And we say that um, you know the vector a is x2 minus x1. And the vector b, I'll call this a, I think uh, we'll put an r for reference. And we'll call this one here b r. Well, if we go over to the deformed configuration, and we have you know, those map to x1, x2, and x3. Then um, the spatial vectors a, and b defining those displacements we would have you know if if the distance between we'll write it out f here is the deformation gradient as x, we'll call it 2. And the same thing, um, b goes to f br as x3 minus x1 gets small. <clears throat> All right, so that's what we mean by mapping tangent vectors in the reference configuration to tangent vectors in the current configuration. Let me label that. There we go. All right, we require that the deformation be a diffeomorphism, so it can't rip the body into two separate pieces, cause it to penetrate itself, collapse a part of the body with non-zero volume to zero volume. Um, all those restrictions that, you know, the reality of matter uh, places on things. Um, this does limit us in our ability to describe fracture problems, like where something actually does pinch off into two parts. Or if you're talking about a multi-phase flow, this will restrict our ability to deal with, say, moving contact lines. So if you have a cup that's got water in it that goes up so high and air at the top, um, if you're also considering the cup as a material, so you're modeling all three, you know, say glass, liquid, and air, um, then the idea that that contact line can move, like if you were to tip the cup, um, that's kind of incompatible with this way of looking at things and describing them mathematically, since chi has to be continuous um, even between the material species. Um, and that is, you know, a real challenge for people. Um, but it's also, if you think about what's going on at those interfaces, those really aren't necessarily continuum phenomena. Those are kind of atomic level things. And so continuum mechanics, we can modify it to make it able to deal with interfacial effects, but that's all extra stuff beyond the, uh, 
context of this course. So we're gonna, if we do multi-material things, it'll be ones where, you know, there is no slip at the interface. Um, so, you know, like I said, people have come up with ways of dealing with those sorts of things, fracture and uh, moving contact lines, things like that. But we're not gonna deal with them here because continuum mechanics is difficult enough without doing that. All right, so we have a few restrictions on the deformation chi for it to define an admissible motion. First is that it's going to be continuous in both space and time. And that's kind of a non-negotiable one, um, apart from fracture, but we're not dealing with that. And then this one is somewhat negotiable. The gradient of chi at a fixed time is piecewise smooth. So we're, our math is going to be all of our continuous equations that we come up with are kind of going to be based on it being smooth. But if it's piecewise smooth, so it can have jumps in the gradient, um, as long as those are limited to nice smooth surfaces, so you could have like a shock wave, contact, discontinuity, things like that, um, we're able to come up with jump conditions <clears throat> relating the jump in the, uh, the, def the deformation gradient to the jump in the state values or the stresses and things like that. But we need it to be smooth pretty much over the whole space except for a few surfaces that themselves have to be smooth. And then three, the determinant of the deformation gradient, which we'll call J, capital J, of the material point X at any time T, has to be greater than zero, um, and that'll be for all X in the reference body, and for all T, <clears throat> we'll say, any time t. So this is a statement that there is no self-penetration. You know, it can't collapse volumes to zero volume, flip space inside out. So a consequence of that is going to be that chi sub t of x, so the deformation at any given time, is 1 to 1. So in other words, two reference points never map to the same spatial point, or they would have collapsed something that had volume or length to something that doesn't. So a consequence of chi being one-to-one one is that it's invertible 
if we restrict our focus in the range space to the image of the reference body under chi. <coughs> So what this is saying is that if we pick, you know, so we have over here the reference body and we have over here the spatial configuration, <coughs> um, you know, it's going to take It takes this point x1 to x1 over there, but it also says that if we pick an x2, uh, there is exactly one reference configuration point x2 that is going to correspond to x2 in the spatial configuration. So this is. x1 is equal to chi t reference x1 and reference x2 is equal to the fixed time inverse chi of t of spatial x2. And what we're saying, restricting our attention to the image of the reference body under chi is to say, you know, um, say this is x3. Um, well, chi t inverse of x3 is undefined. Right, it's not a point that is occupied by material at time t, so we can't find <coughs> the corresponding point in the reference body. Um, forget whether I mentioned it, but this j here is called the volumetric Jacobian. All right, so there are two spatial vector fields involving time derivatives of chi that are going to be of interest. Spatial vector field meaning that it returns a vector in the spatial configuration as an argument of point in space. chi dot. This is with a fixed point in the reference configuration, so for a fixed material point, see, which is defined as partial derivative of chi x and t, respect to t. So when we put a dot over things from now on, we're going to say that is for a fixed material point as opposed to for a fixed spatial point. Although here chi is not a function of spatial points, so it kind of is without saying that that's the case. But um, in general, 
when we start doing quantities where there can be some ambiguity, the dot is going to refer to the partial time derivative holding the reference configuration point fixed, and we'll use prime to denote the time derivative holding a spatial point fixed. Um, but we'll get there. And chi double dot. Defined as the second partial time derivative of chi. with respect to t. Are the velocity and acceleration of the material point at time t. And so those are spatial vectors. You know, it's um, in the current configuration. That's what the velocity and acceleration are. When we want to do our math in components, we'll choose a fixed orthonormal basis for the underlying Euclidean space in which the reference configuration, spatial configuration, and all admissible configurations live. And that basis will not vary with time or space or get transformed by chi. In other words, it's fixed and constant. And it's a way that we describe everything else that's happening. And we'll choose a positively oriented basis, so E1 dot E2 cross E3 is equal to 1. That does not vary or get transformed. A consequence of chi being a diffeomorphism between the reference body and the spatial body is that points in its boundary remain in its boundary, and points in its interior remain in its interior. So the image of the boundary of the reference body under the deformation is equal to the boundary of the body in the spatial configuration. And the image 
of the interior of the body, so everything but the boundary, <coughs> is equal to the interior of the body in the deformed configuration. Also, for any smooth interior subregion, So we'll say P is a subregion of the reference configuration body. And although it doesn't matter here, um, whenever we're doing anything, we're always going to restrict our attention to nicely shaped subregions. So with P equal to the union of its interior, and its boundary, which is to say that P is a nice region that is basically an open subregion, just like an open interval, plus uh, the boundary of it. So it's not some stupid shape that's got like extra little points hanging out there or like zero volume surfaces going along with it. It's just a nice smooth region that has volume and a nice smooth boundary. Um, and like I said, here it doesn't matter, but for some things, like when we start trying to do calculus, of course it matters. And so, you know, it, it's just always going to be the case that we are restricting our attention to nice ones. Uh, let's see. Then we have first that those points in the deformed configuration are just equal to chi t of p um, and 2, because it's a material region, so it deforms with the rest of it. Um, the boundary of any material subregion is equal to chi t of the boundary <coughs> of the reference subregion, which means that material does not cross the boundary of a materially convecting region. All right, that'll be the end of this lecture. <clears throat> the next one will be on the deformation gradient. Um, so now we've got to the part of the book where the chapters, most of them are pretty short, you know, like a page or two, maybe three. Uh, so the lectures will probably get shorter and more frequent. Um, and I'm not necessarily going to go through every section of every chapter or even every chapter. Um, but the ones that I skip, I would ask that you read and try to understand, do an exercise or two. But um, the ones that I skip, I am doing so just because I don't believe that they are totally vital to being able to do the course content. And of course, this uh, book is quite long, and we're not going to get to all of the book, but we do want to make sure that we get through all of the balance laws and everything and um, get to developing at least a couple constitutive theories using what's called the coleman knoll procedure, um, because that's really what this course is all about, is coming up with constitutive models that are logical, which will mean that they will obey the second law of thermodynamics and be consistent with all of the balance laws. All right, hope you guys have been having a good weekend. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be getting out that deformation gradient lecture probably later today and still working on the grading, but that'll be soon enough. Uh, I don't expect you to have to wait past Monday for that. 
and homework three is due Friday. Um, all right, catch you later.